This is Arab Talk on KPOO 89.5 FM in San Francisco. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. I'm Jess Khanam. And I'm Jamal Dajani. Jamal, we have a really outstanding show today. Uh, we're, in case our listeners may have been not around, I mean, the apartheid regime of Israel has a new uh, prime minister, and that's Naftali Bennett, who is an avowed uh, racist committed to ethnic cleansing of Palestinians and uh, indigenous people in historic Palestine in a new kind of power sharing agreement among very disparate elements with the Israeli electorate. Uh, the the 12-year reign of Benjamin Netanyahu is over. And we have Naftali Bennett for the next couple of years. We'll be hearing from Ronnie Barkan, who you did a really fantastic interview with. But let's make it clear, within the first three days of Naftali Bennett's uh, regime, they uh, initiated a rather catastrophic bombing of innocent civilians in Gaza. They continued to try to ethnically cleanse Palestinians from the Sheikh Jarrah area and other parts of East Jerusalem. So... What's the old saying, Jamal? Uh, old wine in new bottles. I mean, Naftali Bennett, but has anything really changed? Uh, nothing has changed. Uh, I mean, Naftali Bennett is is really, I would say, uh, to the right of Benjamin Netanyahu. So as you'll see from the interview with uh, Rani Barkan, it's just really another side of the coin. Um, in fact, it's just a facade to say that Israel had its elect- uh, its democracy and this government looks, uh, which we talk about, uh, a little bit different. You know, they have uh, Palestinians, uh, Palestinian 1948, part of the coalition. You have people to the right, you have people to the left. But let's face it, the reins of power uh, remain with with the likes of Neftali Bennett and and even with his uh, uh, co prime minister or the prime minister who is going to be in his place two years ago, Gantz. It's not going to change any policy uh, in in the Israeli attitude. It's not going to change anything when it comes to the settlements. It's not going to change anything when it comes to the uh, ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in Jerusalem. And we saw just a couple of days ago, this new government allowed the racist uh, uh, Kahanist and uh, Lahava, right, etc., right. to do their protest. And we'll see some images of this. Uh, they're still chanting death to the Arabs, burn their villages down, and all kinds of slurs uh, targeting Palestinians. So it's just going to, in my opinion, he said nothing changes. My opinion, it's going to get worse. So uh, let's watch the interview with Rani Barkan. After 12 years of Benjamin Netanyahu, Israel selected a new prime minister, Naftali Bennett, who is described as a far-right ideologue whose positions are to the right of Netanyahu's. In 2013, as Middle East peace talks were set to resume, after a five-year freeze, Bennett reportedly proclaimed to Israeli National Security Advisor uh, Yaakov Amidror, I've killed lots of Arabs in my life and there is no problem with that. Joining us to discuss this and more, Rani Barkan, a longtime Israeli Jewish activist who describes himself as a privileged Israeli Jew living at the belly of the apartheid beast. Welcome again to Arab Talk, Rani. Hi, Jamal. Thank you for having me. So let's start with uh, with Bennett and his government. First, how did they manage to unseat uh, Netanyahu? And and then who's 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 Neftali Bennett? We want to know, actually. A lot of people don't know what who's Neftali Bennett is all about. Yes. Yeah, so first of all, as you mentioned, Neftali Bennett has been kind of this icon of the emerging right wing in Israel, uh, unapologetic about it not speaking very much human rights discourse. Uh, and the way that he was able to um, basically become minister this time around is it, actually he does not have the largest uh, party, um, but actually Yair Lapid, who is now uh, the vice uh, uh, prime minister, 
uh, has actually went to lengths in order to be able to build this coalition only in order to oust Netanyahu, uh, uh, whereby basically Bennett will be in power. I mean, there will be after a couple of years, there will be a rotation and then Lapid will, be, will become prime minister. Um, but they have given up a lot of their own interest in order for the greater interest, as far as they are concerned, which is uh, to oust Netanyahu. Uh, and they have managed to join forces uh, in this government that is regarded in Israel as some sort of a change and uh, even a lefty government by many, um, because they have some people who are associated with the liberal Zionist camp, while obviously the vast majority are people like uh, Lapid and uh, Bennett, which are cannot do not even speak the human rights discourse. Uh, and But they were successful in ousting Netanyahu just by basically a very small margin, basically one seat. Uh, that is what uh, is the differentiator between the coalition and the opposition these days. I mean, as you said, if you look at the government, I mean, for, for those, for the untrained eye and people who don't understand Israeli politics, you'll say, wow, this is a great government. You have Arabs... Uh, who joined this uh, this coalition? You have uh, some of the liberals. You have left. You have right, and you have the extreme right. I mean, it, it looks very diverse, but uh, is it? So again, the question is: Do we could do we do we use the framework of Israeli politics, Israeli discourse, or a universal humanistic discourse? And that is a very big difference because within Israel. First of all, the, whole, the only notion of democracy is if the majority decides. And when we talk about the majority, they only count themselves within that. So first of all, they created an ethnically pure state by either driving away the indigenous people from their land or by denying them basic rights, those who are still under Israeli control within Palestine. In practice, only 44% of the entire population of Israel-Palestine has voting rights, out of which... 36 belong to the privileged group that I belong to, and another 8% uh, belong to those who are by law subjugated second-class citizens of the state, and their vote means absolutely nothing or very little. Uh, they are 48ers, so-called, uh, you know, so-called uh, Israeli Arab in the Israeli discourse. So, first of all, they created this facade of democracy. They created a way in which they and only they can uh, make the important decisions, and within that framework there is this discussion over right versus left. Right is what I regard as the honest Zionists, the unapologetic ones who are racist and proud of it. People like Naftali Bennett, for example. And the so-called left in Israel are those who are self-proclaimed liberal Zionists. They are the ones who sugarcoat their racism and supremacy and deliver it in a much nicer packaging. Uh, and they speak about human rights and peace, etc. while they are just as supremacist, just as racist, and just as supportive of that criminal race state, the Zionist race state that exists here for the, over seven decades now. So in my perspective, nothing has changed within this government. In their perspective, everything has changed because now there is this other discourse uh, that Netanyahu, uh, Netanyahu represents one type of discourse. And now there is kind of this plethora of this so-called rainbow of ideas, but the entire rainbow of Israeli discourse is all about maintaining apartheid and maintaining an ethnically pure state. Well, you're talking about uh, ethnic cleansing and apartheid. Let's talk about Sheikh Jarrah. You know, right now, Israel's courts are in the process of ethnically cleansing uh, the East Jerusalem neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, we've talked about this on the show uh, several times. Uh, uh, just to brief our audience here, Israel is now trying to return the properties uh, uh, to the Jewish trusts who later sold them to Nahalat Shimon, a real estate company registered in the U.S. Uh, United, uh, the U.S. state of Delaware. The, the funny part about it is that uh, while Israel regularly uses uh, this tactic to remove Palestinians from East Jerusalem, Israeli law bars Palestinians from recovering property they lost uh, during the Nakba, even if they still reside in areas controlled by, by Israel. So, uh, I mean, how is the Israeli public uh, seeing this? Is this... Uh, an embarrassment to some to see that here are you have Palestinians. I mean, many Israelis live in Palestinian homes taken uh, in 1948 
and then you have this, this, these families who lived there since 1948, and now they're getting evicted. Yeah, so you touched the heart of the matter here with Sheikh Jarrah. And many people think that this is yet another form of Israeli occupation. And when they say occupation, they mean that occupation of 1967. When I say occupation, I mean that occupation and apartheid and colonialism and everything that revolves around the race state, which started in 1948 at the latest. Sheikh Jarrah is a very important example, which most people are not aware of, not because of the oppression that takes place there against people who are citizens or what's called permanent residents of Jerusalem, um, but rather because this is, uh, from the legal perspective, this is a Pandora box that, that uh, Israel, especially the left-leaning uh, parties, are very, very cautious about. I'll, I'll explain it in this way. The law that precedes pre-48 law, which is basically uh, inherited from Ottoman and uh, British uh, law, does not differentiate between people based on their ethnicity. It has other issues, but it does not differentiate explicitly based on that. The post-48, post-1948 post law, which was established, which was basically legislated by the state of Israel, is all about that. It's all about giving privileges to people of my background and taking away the basic rights of the others, including the right to actually live in their land. Six million people are denied for the past seven decades the right to go back home, and they are in forced exile for seven decades simply because they have ethnicity. So the pre-48 law, touching on that and going to Israeli courts with some argument that relates to a pre-48 property right, that is a very tricky situation for Israelis because they may claim, just like they did in Sheikh Jarrah over the past uh, couple of decades, that there is some property that predates the state of Israel, predates 48, and was somehow held by a uh, some Jewish owner. By the way, there are no houses in these places, but there was the land. Later on, there was everything that you mentioned, and people were evicted from there. Jewish people were evicted from there. Palestinians came in their place. They were uh, they were building their houses, and now that Israeli court comes and says, "Ah, hold on, there is something that predates 48. It is proven to us." sometimes in very uh, unkosher ways, uh, that um, that this is so-called Jewish ownership. And therefore, um, we, the court, the Israeli court, decides to evict these Palestinians who have been living there for decades for the sake of these Jewish settlers, Zionist settlers, to be exact. There is only one problem with that, because that law, the pre-48 law, does not discriminate in its very nature. That means that maybe a few hundreds or thousands of Zionists would be able to reclaim property that was pre-48, but that also means that the vast majority of Palestinians, the vast majority of the people of this land should be able to pass the very same law in order to reclaim their properties for basically the entirety of Palestine, which is now called Israel. So from the legal perspective, this is opening a Pandora box that no one is interested in. And this is why you see people who are affiliated with liberal Zionist camp, with the so-called leftist camp, including the former attorney general of Israel, Michael Ben Yair, going against the expulsion of Palestinians from Sheikh Jarrah. Not because he cares about Palestinians, because he cares about not allowing such a legal precedent. So, Because if the legal precedent applies, probably he himself lives in a Palestinian home and he will need to vacate that, right? His story is actually even more interesting because he himself was evicted from Sheikh Jarrah uh, at the time. And he says, and compensated about himself, their family was compensated, were evicted from there. And they, you know, and they are living uh, in West Jerusalem, what is regarded as, uh, you know, sort of within the green line, as if Jerusalem is not entirely occupied. Um, and and he says that was that was fair and that was the just thing to do at the time. We shouldn't go back to the courts and reclaim our rights because we were evicted from there before 48. So he himself may have the possibility to go to that same court that evicted things from Sheikh Jarrah and do it himself to evict other Palestinians. But he says, no, 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 we shouldn't do that. We should be very wary of that situation. Other people who are less apologetic, who fall into the right wing camp, from the get-go, they say this is ours and only ours. From the very beginning, they are less concerned about what the world will think about the situation. They are less concerned about uh, um, giving uh, uh, some sort of a rational reasoning and more about 
their power to control the situation. And since they are the powerful side, they will dictate to the others, including the Palestinians in East Jerusalem. So this is something that Bennett also represents Bennett, Nafali Bennett. He is very unapologetic in his tone. Actually, one of, one of his uh, plans from about a decade ago was what's called, uh, it's the annexation plan. He called it the tranquilizing or something like that, the, uh, the quieting plan. And basically he said there is no ideal solution to the so-called Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So what I offer is that we will annex the entirety of the uh, Area C in the West Bank, which has the majority of the Zionist settlers and relatively few Palestinians in it. It is the vast majority of the land of the West Bank with all the important resources, uh, natural resources, etc. We should annex that because we want to maintain our demographic uh, supremacy. We want to maintain the possibility to deny an influx of refugees, meaning Palestinian refugees who are basically scattered everywhere around the world, especially just across the border in Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, etc. And and we shouldn't care so much what the world thinks about it. This is the discourse that Naftali Bennett was offering already 10 years ago. Um, and he says, yes, and the world will not like it. But then again, they also don't like us uh, controlling uh, the Golan Heights or Jerusalem. They don't recognize that. So they, so here's another thing to the list that will not recognize. This is his discourse. When he later um, in another election campaign some years ago, his whole slogan was, we are not apologizing. So he is in his very nature and in his very discourse, unapologetic about such issues. In that sense, he will also be unapologetic about the eviction of people from Sheikh Jalla. Um, so this is this acts in two in two different directions. The way it is exposing Israel for what it really is, and in that case, let it be. I mean, I don't want people to be evicted, but I do want uh, the true face, the not so liberal face of Israel, to be exposed. And Naftali Bennett is quite good at doing that. Uh, at the same time, obviously, uh, it means that when people who are unapologetic about that discourse are in power, um, it could get dangerous for those who are uh, under the immediate threat of expulsion uh, and bombing, etc. With the current government, I don't know what to tell you, but no analysis will, will suffice because basically you have all these different voices which want different things, which, fe which speak a different type of discourse. Some are of the unapologetic, unapologetic discourse. Other come from the very apologetic discourse and this liberal facade of Israel, etc., with regard to Palestinians, with regard to LGBT rights, with regard to many issues, and they represent very opposing views. How will that last? I don't know. No one can really tell. Probably this government will not uh, last uh, the entire four-year term, but I don't, I don't know. What does matter to me is that there is no actual change uh, within the character regarding the character, the supremacist character of the state of Israel, the very nature of apartheid and colonialism of that state, the very nature that uh, denies people ba people's basic rights based on their racial ethnic characteristics. And until such a time that the entire, all 20 million sons and daughters of the land, including only 7 million who belong to the privileged group and another roughly 12, 30 million who are Palestinians, until a time when all 20 million will have voting rights and you know the right to, to decide on their future, then I don't think that a significant change uh, will take place. This is what we are aiming for, for all people, all 20 million, to have a say and to decide on a better future. Yeah, I've uh, actually, uh, like a few weeks ago, I think uh, uh, we've had Miko Pelled on, on this show, and then he said pretty much the same thing, that there wouldn't be any change, except he said it's actually a good change because uh, Naftali Bennett, unlike Benjamin Netanyahu, it won't be able to mes mesmerize the West and hide all, you know, what Israel is all about, you know, because, uh, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu pretends that he wants peace and it's uh, and he's been trying to to work something out while grabbing more land etc but he said he Naftali Bennett won't be able to hide that I mean do you agree with this assessment Absolutely Naftali Bennett is as I said he's unapologetic about his discourse about his aims about his goals uh, and 
it is yet to be seen how how he will be perceived in the rest of the world. At the same time, uh, so far, uh, there seems to be uh, quite a lot of excitement about this new government, you know, and I've seen all kinds of articles referring to Israeli democracy, quote unquote, mm -hmm. you know, and some sort of revival of Israel democracy, whatever, because they managed to oust Netanyahu, who is corrupt, etc. Uh, and he, in their eyes, represents something that is undemocratic, but they, they are willing to lend legitimacy to a government like Naftali Bennett or any government that is all about supremacy and uh, and uh, ethnic cleansing, etc. So, in one way, uh, I think that Bennett uh, will basically drive a message that is unapologetic, and and that uh, basically exposes her for what it is, and it shouldn't uh, be accepted by the rest of the world. On another, in another way, though, because this is. Uh, there is this so-called rainbow of ideas within the current coalition, uh, including people who are affiliated with the left wing, including even in the source of Israel, who don't represent much of the Palestinian uh, interests, of course. Um, then, then there is this kind of semblance of democracy. There seems to be some sort of uh, kind of left and right coalition there, even though as I tried to mention, uh, to explain, there is no real difference between what they want. Yair um, Lapid, who is now, who will be the, the foreign minister, uh, and uh, he actually basically gave up his, um, because he had a high, more votes than, than Bennett, but, he had, but in order to be able to oust Netanyahu, he actually stepped back and let Bennett become the the first in his prime, uh, becoming prime minister first before him. Yair Lapid, uh, he's regarded as a centrist in Israel. What was part of his uh, agenda? The party's agenda, the polit uh, the they're very uh, um, in their manifesto and everything. They are fighting BDS. They have have a booklet that they, were, that they were issuing some years ago where they are fighting the delegitimization, as it's called, of Israel. And he goes around the world speaking a much more liberal discourse than Bennett would. And he is all about lending legitimacy and fighting those who aim to delegitimize this illegitimate race state, Zionist race state. Um, so, so Lapid is kind of exposed something that is more about trying to live what Israel does. And then you have people who are regarded as more liberal Zionists, so-called left, including Merav Michaeli of the Labour Party. Uh, and, um, and, and, you know, they are even speaking a, a, even a feminist discourse and an LGBT-friendly discourse. So you will have all these different types of narratives within that same government, even those who think that, uh, uh, you know, LGBT should uh, have full rights and those who think that they should have no rights at all. Um, you know, Israel boasts about, for example, being very uh, gay friendly, while at the same time, its official state policy with regard to Palestinians is to threaten Palestinians of uh, to threaten Palestinians from out, uh, outing them if they do not become um, informants of the state of Israel. Israel claims to have uh, you know very sophisticated uh, and accessible you know healthcare system, but it is only for the privileged group. At the same time, they condition in many cases uh, cancer treatments for Palestinians if they do not collaborate with the regime in one way or another. So this is part and parcel of Israeli politics. Policy, um, and you can you can look at it in both ways. You can look at the semblance, uh, this facade of normality and liberalism, or you can look at the greater picture, which actually is the exact opposite of that. There is normality. Well, I mean, and, I mean, yeah. I mean. Of course, they can play this game uh, when they come to the United States and they come um, meet with Congress. I'm talking about Israeli leaders, but uh, now, uh, uh, you know, as they say, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. They cannot ignore, for example, just yesterday you had all these Israelis marching uh, uh, in East Jerusalem, waving the flags and chanting again, death to Arabs. Yes. Uh, you know, and how, how do they hide this? I mean, I mean, this is something like what, what sometimes I read in the Israeli media. They just say, oh, they're just a fringe element. It, they're not a fringe element. I mean, all the, the numbers have been increasing. Yes. Look, I keep saying that, you know, uh, 
successful propaganda is not about uh, uh, creating the facts. It is about using the facts, but creating a, a whole alternative narrative, like pretty much everything that Haaretz newspaper publishes about Israel-Palestine. And, and in that alternative reality that they publish, they would regard, they would not deny the fact is people who are marching and shouting death to Arabs, and uh, they have this song about we, we should burn their villages and things like that. Uh, we should avenge, uh, you know, all kinds of like really horrible statements, very, very uh, racist and fascist statements. Um, so they would regard these people, but as the fringe, not as representing the majority. Uh, but actually, if you look at these uh, videos, uh, first of all, you can see the numbers. You can see how the Israeli police is more than allowing them to harass and terrorize the Palestinians living in East Jerusalem. And they arrest uh, the Palestinians. Uh... They arrest the Palestinians, exactly, simply because they exist there. Maybe they, they say something about uh, disliking that um, that demonstration, that uh, march, and immediately they will get arrested. While at the same time, they so-called protect the, the freedom of these brown shirts from walking down the streets of East Jerusalem and terrorizing the population. But there's even, even worse inter incidents than they have it documented. I can share with the audience. Um, these brown shirts, these uh, Zionist fascists walking in the streets of Jerusalem and stopping cars uh, checking to see whether the driver is Palestinian or not, with the attempt to beat up the driver, should he be Palestinian. And, and we have documented that uh, during the previous, uh, the 2014 massacre of Gaza, as there was the assault on Gaza in 2014, people in Jerusalem, and a large number of them were doing these things, walking down the streets and just looking to express their anger and hatred towards Palestinians. This is not a fringe group. You have an entire uh, uh, football club, Beitar Jerusalem, which is known to be uh, more than racist. They have uh, they, 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 one of their slogans is, uh, uh, you know, keeping uh, Beitar pure and denying uh, some 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 uh, players there uh, from the ability to participate in that club because they were not Jewish. I this mean, the fans, the fans of the club, they're, they're horrible. I've seen videos of them uh, attacking uh, players who are, uh, let's say, uh, black or, or Arab, of course. They, they go berserk. I mean, we're not talking about just the ownership, but we're talking about the fans at large. Yes. So I think that, you know, in, in other countries, sometimes the government does not necessarily represent the people. In Israel, it very much represents the people. And uh, that means that, yes, you do have this rainbow of ideas, as I mentioned before, even though the so-called liberal um, view is uh, becoming less and less dominant. Uh, and the more unapologetic view and the more racist view is becoming more vocal. But it was always there, and it is coming in great numbers. Uh, but we shouldn't be fooled by the fact that you have these different types of views. You have some who are more to some who are maybe sugarcoating their racism. We should look at this, uh, you know, with proper uh, eye, like with, you know, vision and, and, uh, and look at the greater picture, the entire picture, not, uh, you know, not this or that element that seems to us as liberal, while at the same time, the entire system is that of oppression, subjugation, terrorism against 12 million Palestinians, half of which are in forced exile for the past seven decades, another uh, 5 million or so under brutal military military occupation that denies them every basic right. And then even those who are supposedly, uh, supposedly living under Israeli democracy and are regarded as Israeli citizens, they are by law second-class citizens uh, where even their vote means very little. So yes, they can participate in the uh, game, participate in this uh, charade of uh, democracy, but it means uh, very little because by law, they cannot actually even democratize the place. In the UN report on Israeli apartheid by professors Tillian Falk, they regard this um, right to vote for Palestinians or citizens of Israel, they say that this is like slaves, the right to vote, but not, but not in order to abolish slavery. So yes, Palestinians who are citizens of Israel, they can vote, but not for anything of importance. They cannot even, those who, part who vote and who participate in the Israeli parliament, which is an apartheid parliament by design, they cannot change anything about it. They cannot, by law, 
democratize that place. And that is why people like myself actually see the actual acting, the actual act of voting to that apartheid parliament as an oppressive act. I, the very act of voting to that parliament as being just as oppressive as participating in, in the Israeli terror forces, which again have this nice name, Israel Defense Forces, even though Israel, it has nothing to do with defense. I'd like to say one more thing about Jerusalem because we touched it. Sure. In, in Gaza and, and the West Bank, you have the military, which is oppressing Palestinians and, and bombarding them, etc. In Jerusalem, In Jerusalem, you have all arms of the state the military, the police, the Shin Bet, the municipality, and all these other organizations, even archaeological organizations and so on, all oppressing the residents of Jerusalem. And you, Jamal, you know very well about the situation in Jerusalem. Uh, and, and it is amazing how they use seemingly civilian means, for example, um, denying housing permits or, or, or demolishing houses that were built without permit and things like that, denying access to certain territories. The moment that these are Palestinians, for example, the Shin Bet, the Israeli security service, known that it is handing a blacklist, a list of, uh, of, uh, of people that Palestinians who are maybe vocal about their politics, they're handing this blacklist to the municipality and that municipality will, will issue fines against these people. So they are using uh, these um, civil, uh, basically, practices in order to enforce something with a political nature, something that, which is uh, about silencing and oppressing uh, uh, that population. It never ends. Uh, I mean, we could talk about this for hours, uh, Rani. I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, the situation in Jerusalem is very dire because uh, Israel uh, has a plan. They want to make sure that they maintain 70% Jewish majority in the city. So they play all kinds which of... Which is the official plan. Until, uh, yes. Policy. Yeah, we, which is they'll, they'll do anything, stripping people from their uh, residency, um, IDs. Uh, if somebody gets married outside, someone from outside, they get rid of them. They lose, they threaten them also sometimes losing their uh, health insurance. You know, let's say if you worked uh, uh, in Ramallah uh, because you couldn't find a job in Jerusalem, you lose your health insurance. All kinds of games basically to drive Palestinians uh, outside of the city. Yes. And, you know, whenever, when there is such a system of oppression, and this system of oppression, which exists for over seven decades, uh, it has different aspects. It manifests itself in different ways, depending on geography, depending on who it is acting against. So there are those who are second-class uh, second class citizens of the state of Israel. Those, there are those who are under military occupation. There are those who are residents of East Jerusalem. There are those who are in the diaspora and the Shatat. And, you know, each one experiences different aspects of that system of oppression. But in order to work against that, we actually have to abolish that system of oppression. And it is not enough to, uh, to think that some government, which even if it was supposedly a government that represents a change in Israel, in, under that system of oppression, which is, you know, and that government is part and parcel of that system, will do anything to abolish that system, will do anything to really, uh, to have a, a real transformation. And the, I think that the way to do it is by pressure from the outside. I would like to, uh, you know, to send my thanks and love to the people who are for demonstrating uh, in the U.S. with block of the boat, blocking Israeli uh, containers, like, you know, ships from, from docking. And we see the solidarity coming from uh, the unions there. Um, if there's a people of Palestine action, for example, in the UK, which are uh, taking over uh, Elbit factories, arms factories, those that produce the weapons and the drones that that are used to bomb Gaza. And they're literally taking over the factory, the rooftops, and, and basically uh, putting this whole uh, machine of oppression, uh, system of oppression on halt. And uh, I think that I urge people to take part. It, it doesn't mean that they have to take uh, uh, part in things that are, are regarded as terrorists. There's also forms of solidarity uh, and just just notifying other people, your Congress uh, man or woman, uh, the media, etc. It is very important to know that at the same time that this system of oppression is at full force, there are those who are opposing it, and I think that they are doing quite a good job, so I'd like to commend them.
Rani Barkan, thank you again for coming on Arab Talk. Thank you for having me. That's the voice and the face of Rani Barkan, political analyst, um, Israeli political analyst. That was really, you know, very impressive, Jamal, I have to say. And here, here's the thing. Not only has nothing changed, but you could arguably say things are worse in some ways because it's giving yet another false impression to the world. And I want to come back to that in a minute that somehow Israeli democracy has won out and that they finally got rid of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and now we have this somehow coalition of very diverse uh, elements of Israeli society. But as Rani has said, and it's, you know, we said in the prelude to the interview, this this is far from any change and this should be really a wake-up call to anybody including I'm going to call out Brett Stevens at the New York Times, who is one of the, you know, uh, individuals who say how great this is, that, you know, it's a demonstration of Israeli democracy. It's not really a demonstration of Israeli democracy. It's an Is- it's a demonstration of Israeli Hasbara to try to fool the world yet again that they're doing something under the facade of the name democracy, but continuing the apartheid process that they've had for the last 73 years and will continue to have. I was really disappointed yet again by Joe Biden calling out, you know, Vladimir Putin as he should, but holding up democratic uh, principles and calling out Vladimir Putin for what he's doing with Alexei Navalny, saying America will not stand for this form of abuse against uh, people who politically oppose to any government, yet you have the greatest ally, as Joe Biden calls it, in the apartheid state of Israel, holding hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of political prisoners, torturing them, children, women, without any opportunity for any due cause, without any representation. And yet Joe Biden has the audacity to call out Vladimir Putin, as he should, but give Israel a pass for its atrocities against the concept of democracy every day against Palestinians. It was really tough to watch him uh, put that show on. It's a very uh, good analogy, uh, Jess. Uh, You're absolutely right. I mean, this is uh, in real time. Here you have him coming back and it's always like, you know, we got to speak against what the uh, Russians are doing in the Ukraine. We gotta speak against what the Russians are doing to dissidents. We gotta speak to what the Chinese are doing to dissidents. But when it comes to Israel, Israel always gets a pass. That this is this is you know across the board, the Senate, the Congress, and uh, the administration. And however, people are not gonna buy this. They're not buying this because we have seen the reaction. We have seen what's going on. Uh, when it comes to social media, when it comes to activists, when it comes to famous people. I think this charade is not going to continue for long. You cannot just keep looking the other way, giving Israel a wink and a nod to kill and destroy Palestinian villages and ethnically cleanse them. And at the same time, look on the other side and say, hey, Look at us. We are the bastion of democracy. We are the champions of human rights. When when Biden speaks, frankly, from both sides of his mouth, you know, he he just like preaches democracy and human rights. But when it comes to the Palestinians, they can just get wasted day in, day out. Look what's happening in Sheikh Jarrah. Has the administration said anything about that? Nothing. Nothing. You nothing. Know. They've said nothing about Sheikh Jarrah. They've said nothing, Jamal, about the Kahanis right-wing extremists, many of whom are American citizens, by the way, who are demonstrating uh, in some of the holiest sites uh, in Palestine and in Jerusalem, uh, chanting death to Arabs. That's, and, the, key, and th- that's the key word, just... Uh, when you said that many of them are American citizens, you are 100% correct about this because this is where people like uh, Baruch Goldstein, who murdered right. uh, Palestinians in Al-Ibrahimi Mosque in Hebron, 
They are. Listen to their interviews. They have Brooklyn accents. They have right. Massachusetts accents. You can hear that in that. And, and, and what I'm saying here, just and you are 100% correct, imagine, and I want to ask you this question, that you have people chanting in the streets of New York, in the streets of Chicago, saying death to Jews, burn their villages, and all kinds of things. Will this administration remain silent about this? That's my question. Not, not only would they not remain silent, Jamal, whomever would be caught saying anything as grotesque as that would be arrested and prosecuted for hate crimes. So that, that speaks to the Biden administration hypocrisy. That speaks to the hypocrisy of this government and this administration and this country's foreign policy who have been basically hoodwinked by Israeli Hasbara for so many decades now that it's okay for American citizens in another country to say death to Arabs, death, and to propagate for, for a prime minister of a, of a so-called ally to advocate for ethnic cleansing of another people, for, to advocate principles that are consistent with apartheid and to call them our best, most sacred uh, ally in the region speaks not only to the hypocrisy, which is, you know, you know, just disgusting, but I want to go back to what you said. Why would anybody take Joe Biden and the United States seriously? How can Biden or Xi Jinping, I'm sorry, how can Putin or Xi Jinping or anybody else on the world stage really take the Biden administration seriously when these grotesque violations of human rights are happening every day in Palestine. They're not. And, 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 and people, are, that's, that's what I said earlier, people are not buying this. You can put this facade, you can put this charade, and then people are seeing in real time. I mean, when we see these images, you know, the images of, 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 of uh, those uh, colonial settlers marching in Jerusalem and chanting while receiving, by the way, Israeli protection. And when That's Palestinians right. are getting arrested because they're just trying to confront them peacefully, by the way, you see, the, see, you see them waving Israeli flags, but when a Palestinian wears a Palestinian flag, they get arrested immediately. Or when they do the slightest thing, like crossing the road, they receive Israeli protection. And those images, what I'm saying, except for CNN, except for Fox News, you can find them everywhere on the internet. And you know, That's right. the young generation, they don't even watch these news uh, outlets. Hundreds and hundreds, different angles, different interviews. I mean, these guys are not doing it in the dark of the night, the darkest of the night. They are doing it publicly. They're proud to say that. They are proud to say that they want to destroy and burn Palestinian villages. They are proud to say that they want to ethnically cleanse uh, Jerusalem from Palestinians. And the American embassy is a couple of stones away from what, where is this happening. They know it. Right. They have the recordings. And then the slightest thing that the administration can do is to say, we condemn this. That's we it. condemn it's this so racism. Weak. They just can't even find themselves, they cannot bring themselves to say that, which is ridiculous. Yeah, so, so Jamal, let me ask you a question then. What is the United States, the so-called beacon of democracy, going to Geneva, putting Vladimir Putin on notice, putting Xi Jinping on notice in China, um, Yet celebrating and talking about working collaboratively with a prime with an Israeli apartheid prime minister Naftali Bennett, who is an avowed, committed, proud racist. What what are we to make of that? What other country would the United States, or would any would the United States with any other country with that kind of avowed racism and commitment to ethnic cleansing, would the United States as Joe Biden likes to say, stand shoulder to shoulder with, with the prime minister saying those things. Unfortunately, uh, Jess, I mean, we know probably the third war, they see that hypocrisy. But unfortunately, 
countries in Europe, like Germany, which on its soil the Holocaust was committed, France, England, the UK, they buy into this because they play the same game themselves. You know, right. maybe they have a slight condemnation here and there, the EU as a whole, but they themselves hide behind this facade, which basically uh, gives always uh, Israel, you know, a pass, a pass. On, on all these atrocities and lecture the world about democracy. I mean, the hypocrisy in this reeks. And, and that's why I said maybe third world countries, countries in, in Latin America, South America, in Africa, etc. They see Israel for what it is. But in Europe, and that's why the United States doesn't, doesn't do this alone. It right. does it with uh, cohorts. And, and that's, that's right. the sad thing about it. No, that's exactly right, Jamal. And I think the thing that we're going to continue to um, monitor and, you know, going from your really outstanding interview with Rani Barkan, we see fragmentation within Israeli society. You see Palestinians in 1948, Palestinians who have Israeli citizenship now, who are being targeted, who are being arrested, who are being you know you know so called in this in the so called democracy you're being treated as second and third and fourth class citizens uh in the apartheid regime of israel so we are beginning to see some fragmentation within israeli society itself and that could put the most pressure on israeli society more than any american president more than anything else coming from any other part of the world because that facade uh, you know, when when the when the Israelis hear the criticism from the outside, they feel you know they get very defensive, right? They they kind of get into you know their defense mode and their Hasbara mode. But within the society, if it begins to crack and shows elements of weakening, that's something that could hasten the dismantlement of its apartheid uh, structure. Correct, and that's why we saw the impact when Human Rights Watch issued a, a statement calling Israel an apartheid. We saw that when uh, uh, Beth Bet Salem said the same thing earlier. And then just uh, recently, just the uh, uh, Peace Now movement, the American branch of the Peace Now movement, called for conditioning uh, the U.S. aid to Israel. And that's, 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 that's a first. Uh, they, they're basically... Sup wow. Supporting uh, representatives, uh, representative McCollum's, uh, uh, you know, uh, bill, and and that's what they said. Uh, I want to uh, change topics here a little bit. It's still related and talk about something uh, actually important because uh, yeah, it's uh, even though this is uh, today marks the two years since the death of Mohammed Morsi, which people. Uh, have forgotten about him. He was I haven't, Egypt's uh, first. And, I haven't. You haven't. And, we haven't uh, forgotten. Probably only freely elected president, um, an academic and an engineer who studied and taught in California just That's right. uh, before returning to Egypt in the 1980s to teach engineering in Cairo. And then we know the rest of the story, uh, what happened, and, and he he died in, in jail uh, so uh, Egypt has been sidelined since, I think, during the uh, Absolutely. Obama administration. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we know Trump, uh, even though he did not support Egypt a lot, but his favorite saying was to say that Sisi was his favorite dictator, uh, remember, and, I remember and that. had a conversation and two with him. But uh, Joe Biden had a couple of conversations with Sisi. So uh, Sisi is back. Uh, the Egyptian president, Abdel Fattah Sisi, has actually had uh, some good months. Uh, he uh, Turkey is trying to kind of uh, bring back Egypt to its uh, environment um, um, and improve their bilateral ties, which were basically strained since July of 2013 coup. Right. 
Egypt has also has uh, had uh, strengthened its relationship with Jordan and, and Iraq. And then recently, it, uh, he has taken credit of the ceasefire of uh, May 21st. So we have to say that, that actually, that Hamas actually praised him uh, because uh, of A, for the very first time, Egypt did not shut the borders That's between right. Gaza and Egypt. So um, the supplies, the resupplying them and so forth was ongoing. And recently Egypt has sent hundreds of construction machinery. Oh, yeah. That's right, for reconstruction. And dedicated $500 million towards the reconstruction of Gaza. Right. I'm not so sure, Jamal, that CC given everything that's going on in the world right now. I mean, maybe politically he's doing okay, but Egypt still has a lot of problems, man, so I'm not so sure. But stay tuned. Here on Arab Talk, we'll continue to talk about these events, including what's happening in Palestine. Thank you for joining us today. See you next week. Thank you.